It was a huge topic in the last and final presidential debate. We're talking about the national debt. But what exactly is the national debt? And just how concerned as citizens should we be? To help us break it all down and understand exactly what's going on, we are joined tonight by Professor of Economics at the NYU Stern School of Business, Professor Nicholas Economidis, who joins us on the other end of the line tonight. Welcome, Professor. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us and, uh, you know, helping us understand this whole issue. So first of all, what exactly is the national debt? Well, the national debt is uh, various uh, obligations of the, of the United States that the United States does um, issues um, IOUs to people like you and me uh, so that we lend essentially money to the government. Uh, so that the government can spend it right now and pay us in the future. And what is that number at now? What is the debt now? Um, it's about uh, $19 trillion. So this is um, money the U.S. actually owes and has to pay back. Right. And this is money that is owed to uh, individuals like you and me. It's owed to institutions uh, like uh, U.S. banks. It's also owned to uh, foreign countries like um, uh, China or a- anywhere. Yeah. When I think of the national debt, I think of, you know, a personal debt, like money I would owe. Is that the right way to think about the national debt or is that a misconception? Well, in some way, uh, it's different because it's uh, collective obligations of uh, all Americans together. That's the first difference. Uh, the second difference is that um, the uh, countries like the United States live forever, and therefore the possibility of personal bankruptcy that exists for individuals is not really the same as a country being unable to fulfill its obligations. So since countries live forever, one way or the other, they are able to fulfill their obligations uh, or renegotiate them. So when you hear the number 19 trillion and when you see other statistics um, about the U.S. economy, as an economist, does it alarm you? Well, it's not the most, uh, <laughs> it's not the best by a point uh, of, uh, of reference. It's not the best news. Uh, one uh, has to, one has to, um, kind of balance it with the size of the economy. So 19 trillion for for the United States is something different than 19 trillion for Greece, uh, for example. So the size of the economy is uh, called the gross national product uh, of the United States. And that's approximately 17 or so trillion uh, dollars. So the national debt is about 110 percent more than the total production and consumption in the United States. So the way to judge how big the debt is, is to see how big it is compared to the production of the country. Uh, That's one way to judge it. And the second way to judge it is to try to understand how much do we collectively pay, the taxpayers collectively pay to have this debt. To, to every, every year we have to, to pay interest on this debt and how big is that. So what's a healthy number that we should be at? Is 110% uh, good? No, it's not good. I mean, it, it would be much nicer if we were at 70 or 80%, um, percent, but... At the same time, that's uh, unachievable because every government that we have had for many years keeps increasing the the debt. And sometimes the debt increases much faster than the economy. And during the administration of President Obama, the debt increased much faster than the economy. So that's why we reached this 110%. And can you compare that number to other economies around the world? For instance, do you know what it is in England and or in Greece? Uh, in, in England, is a bit uh, less. I would venture from memory to say something like 90%. Uh, in Greece, 
uh, right now it's about 167 percent and uh, it's expected uh, to go to 180 percent within seven within the next year so but of course uh, greece is a, an extreme and special case because uh, essentially greece um, is unable to to pay its obligations and uh, whatever is able it's able to do it's only because the european countries have uh, extended very large loans to greece at low interest rates and that's how greece survives at, at the moment and that's how greece has actually survived since 2010. so greece is a very special case but uh if you look around the world um the european union would like to have uh a debt to GDP ratio of about 70 or at most 80 percent. This is has not been achieved for most countries, um, and I don't expect that it will be achieved uh, in my lifetime for the United States. You're listening to Cosmos FM here on WNYE 91.5. I'm your host, Amalia Ogoro. We're speaking tonight with NYU Professor of Economics, Dr. Nicholas Economidis. We're talking about the national debt and what we really should be looking at when we're trying to gauge how healthy our economy really is. So if you were advising the next president and um, they were asking you, how can we get a hold of this debt situation? How can we get back to a healthier economy? What kind of things would you propose? Well, uh, the, the present level of U.S. debt is not at an alarming rate. It's not like the problem in Greece. So the, the issue is not how are we going to be able to pay the debt. The issue is, how are we going to be able to grow our economy so that this ratio of debt to gross national product or debt to production, uh, how can we make this ratio in the future be smaller and smaller and smaller? So the way to do that is to grow our economy. So the, 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 the question to ask is, how can we make our economy grow faster? And the way I think we're going to go the economy grow faster is by cutting uh, taxation, especially corporate taxation, so there could be more investment and more creation of jobs and uh, more um, growth, more faster growth for, for the economy. Uh, that's what I think is the most important thing, not the actual number of the debt. So for voters who are worried about the national debt jeopardizing the U.S. and its standing in the world, to them you would say what? I I would tell them that they they shouldn't really look at the debt. What they should look at is economic growth. And they should look at the the, the two candidates and see what their plans are for growing the economy and vote for the candidate that they think is going to grow the economy faster than the other candidate. That's the crucial thing. It's not so much the debt. Well, a lot of people are worried about the U.S.'s debt to China, and they're saying that China is going to overtake the U.S., and the U.S. is so vulnerable because of its debt. What do you think when you hear things like that? Well, I think it's a legitimate concern to think of China as a big economic power overtaking the U.S., but it's not an issue of debt. It's an issue of the Chinese being able to produce um, TVs uh, and all kinds of appliances uh, much cheaper than we are able to produce them. And then we import them from them. That's the issue. Um, that's what makes them, that's what makes China a, a significant world economic uh, power. The fact that the Chinese hold a significant amount of the American debt is not bad news at all. I mean, it means that the Chinese trust us. They trust the U.S. economy. They trust the U.S. government. And uh, they have accumulated very big amounts of the U.S. uh, debt. At the same time, if things don't go well in the United States, it is conceivable that, that the Chinese government will not trust the United States and start selling this debt. I, I don't see this as, as a very likely event, no matter who gets elected. I don't think that's, that's going to happen. 
that's not our issue. That's not an issue. Of, because it's of not in election. China's interest to do that either, is it? Or well, is exactly. It? The, the Chinese government has American debt because it's considered the less risky, the least risky. So, um, and it's still considered the least risky. So there is no reason for them to go sell it and buy a more risky asset. Um, there are plenty of risky assets, and if you look at what the, what China holds, they hold all kinds of assets which are more risky than, than the U.S. debt, but they still hold a significant amount of U.S. debt as, because it's not risky and because they want to have some of their money in um, a, a riskless asset. And when you say that they could sell this debt, what do you mean by that? Well, this debt is obligations of the U.S. government. It's a, it, Think of it as a, a piece of paper that says the U.S. government will pay you 30 years from now $10,000. So you have this piece of paper. This is the bond. Uh, this piece of paper is tradable. You don't really have to wait for 30 years to redeem it. You can sell it tomorrow. And there are plenty of stockbrokers who can help you buy it or sell it. So when I say the, the China could sell this debt, it means um, they would go to the financial markets and sell these obligations of the U.S. government um, that they have. And on the other side, there would be somebody else, maybe a bank, maybe you and me, who is going to buy these obligations. And um, these kind of transactions happen every day. I mean, there's nothing peculiar about them. But of course, if, they, if the Chinese uh, holding 40% of uh, the U.S. debt suddenly decide to sell it all, that could make a difference in the price of debt and interest rates. But again, uh, I think China holds this debt because it helps its stability. And uh, the Chinese government wants stability in the, in the financial markets and will not intervene in such a radical way to disrupt the, the financial markets. Have you gotten a chance to look at the economic policies of the two presidential candidates? I, I have looked at them to some extent. And do you see any one more viable than the other? I think they have uh, very significant um, differences in taxation. Um, Trump uh, wants to cut taxes for every bracket from the lowest to the highest. Uh, Mrs. Clinton wants to keep taxation more or less the same for most brackets, but um, start uh, very steep increases in taxation for people who make um, at least two hundred dollars or $250,000 uh, a year. Uh, so that's the main difference between them. Uh, one uh, wants less taxes for everybody, irrespective of income. The other one has more or less the same taxes for everybody, up to an income of 250000 And then above that, it has very significant uh, increases in, in taxation. Um, I believe that um, it's important, irrespective of the candidates, to have relatively low taxes because that creates an environment in which growth can happen. Um, and if you are like me in, in New York, we have some, because of high city taxes, we have some of the highest taxes in the nation. You're listening to Cosmos FM here on WNYE 91.5. I'm your host, Amalia Ogoro. We're speaking tonight with NYU professor of economics, Dr. Nicholas Economidis. We're talking about the national debt and what we really should be looking at when we're trying to gauge how healthy our economy really is. So how much of a role does the president play in determining how strong the economy is? The president in the United States has limited power to change um, taxation and to some extent to change economic policy. Uh, why is that? Because the way the distribution of, of um, powers exists in the United States, uh, Congress makes decisions on economic matters. So if there is going to be a change in tax rates or anything of that sort on, at the federal level, uh, it has to be done through Congress. 
it doesn't matter what the president wants. I mean, if the president doesn't have Congress with him on whatever proposal, it won't it won't go through. Um, so that's such something to keep in mind that in the United States, the president has a lot of leeway on military matters, but it has he or she has very limited um, power on on the, on economic uh, issues. What about the Federal Reserve? What is their role in all of this? The Federal Reserve is a um, is a is a part of the of the government that um, um, was created to avoid um, economic crisis, especially banking crisis that had plagued the United States before the creation of the Federal Reserve. Uh, there were bank runs. Uh, there were many, many crises that uh, had happened before the creation of the Federal Reserve. And the idea is that if we create the Federal Reserve, that was the idea when it was created, that if we have the Federal Reserve, if there is a significant crisis, then the Federal Reserve can intervene and avert the crisis or minimize it. And that's really what happened in 2008. Um, as you may remember, in 2008, after the collapse of the Lehman Brothers, uh, there was a worldwide financial uh, crisis. Uh, and it wasn't contained just to banks. Many different institutions were close to collapse. So what the Federal Reserve did do then was to make the interest rate, the short-term interest rate, very, very low, almost zero. So right now, for a number of years, for almost eight years, the interest rate has been at zero for short-term uh, borrowing um, for top quality uh, companies. Okay, so what does this mean? Because of that, the collapse of the financial system was averted. Uh, and right now, in 2016, the economy is doing pretty well. The economy has recovered, it's doing pretty well. Nevertheless, the policy of the Federal Reserve is still to have zero interest rates. And that should change. And it's likely that it will change soon after the elections, soon after um, next week, um, sometime probably in December. Um, why is that? Why is it bad to have a very low interest rate? Is because people speculate. People can borrow at very low cost and speculate. And this speculation is rampant for the last six years, and it exists in commodities, uh, in metals like gold and other metals, in uh, real estate, people buying and selling uh, homes without really thinking of keeping them ever, but just to make money in the speculation. So all this is done because the interest rate is too low. Now, we needed this interest rate to be very low to get out of the crisis, uh, especially in 2008, 9, 10. Now we don't need it anymore. And it has this bad side effects I mentioned before, so we really need to find a way um, to get out of it. Um, I believe that the decision on the, of the Federal Reserve has been postponed because of the, the election. But once the election is over, um, I, I'm pretty confident that the Federal Reserve is going to increase interest rates so the whole economy will go into normality rather than steroids. Right now the economy is on steroids, uh, but you can't really keep the economy on steroids forever. It has to get out to normality. And is it true what they say that you don't really know the effects of the policies, the, you don't really know the effects of the economic policies of one president until the next term or two terms later? Um, I wouldn't say that's true. I mean, I, I think that uh, many policies have uh, direct and immediate effects. Now, of course, there are a lot of long run effects that you don't see. Um, so it's a mixture, but I would say that most of the effects are, are seen pretty soon, within a year at most. So bottom line, if uh, you're looking at the debt, 
something to be concerned about, but not the uh, horrible situation that a lot of analysts and media people make it out to be. Yes, I, I would say the debt, if I look at the U.S. economy, the debt is not my concern. Mm -hmm. This is not the, the primary concern that we have in the U.S. economy. Instead, my primary concern is how to make growth increase in the United States so that we have uh, more jobs and more income and more ways to actually pay down the debt over over time. And you're not seeing the kind of growth that you'd want to see? No, I, we don't. Unfortunately, we don't see the kind of growth we would like to see. The, the growth um, that we see on, at the end of the Obama administration is uh, anemic. It's small. It's not a full-blown growth, especially when you look at the number of jobs uh, created. Um, if you look at the total income in the U.S. economy, that looks pretty good. But when you look at the number of people who are working or the percentage of the population that could work and are actually working, that number is low, is much lower than it should be in a well-run, in a fully recovered uh, economy. So we need, we as economists, let's say, and as government, we need to find ways to create more real jobs. And in my opinion, that happens by looking at the areas in which the United States has an advantage, areas such as computing, uh, software, uh, biotechnology. Look at the areas in which we are doing so well and try to make them employ more people to say, look, I mean, these are the great areas. We're going to put more people there to try to say, oh, you know, 20 years ago, we, we used to make TVs in the United States, but we don't anymore. And we're going to somehow start producing TVs again. I, I think that's irrational. That, that's, that won't really work. That won't fix our problem. The idea is there are some things we do well and some things we don't do well. We should really invest more in the things that we, we do well. And the role, to some extent, of the government is to train people or to subsidize um, ways in which people get trained so that they can work in the new technologies in which the United States is doing so well. Hmm. Okay, well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I hope uh, everybody enjoyed that and they got a better sense of what's going on in the situation out there. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.